Hello and welcome to Thrivecast. I'm so glad you're here. It's our very first one. Get excited. Woo. I'm Sweetie. I'm excited, y'all. Super excited. Yay. Today we have some awesome special guests. We have Ian Thompson and Pork Ryan who are going to be here and talking about swine. We're so excited. Uh, before we get started with that, just a big shout out to all of our members and supporters for helping make Swine Chats possible. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. If you don't know how to become a member or supporter, let us know and we will hook you up. <laughs> all right, Ryan, do you want to introduce our very special guest today? Yes. Um, so, guys, there's this pig out there. It's called the Choctaw Hog. Uh, I know very little about it, and I know a lot about pigs. Um, so our special guest, Ian, is going to talk about how influential the Choctaw Nation was to the Choctaw Hog, and how influential the Choctaw Hog was to the nation as well. Um, Ian, could you give us a little bit about yourself for the audience to know, and then we can get into our interview questions and answers. Sound good? Sure. Thank you, Ryan. I'm happy to join you guys today. Thank you for letting me talk about pigs. I, I'm no expert on pigs, but I, I do know a little bit about our culture and pigs are a part of our culture. So I'll, I'll do my best to be interesting and informative. Hey, we're a man of culture, nothing wrong with that. All right. So my name's Ian Thompson. I, I'm Choctaw and I'm Euro-American. Uh, when I was seven years old, my uncle started teaching me how to chip stone arrowheads. And I just, caught fire for wanting to learn Choctaw traditional arts from that age. So I grew up making bows and arrows, doing hide tanning, all that kind of stuff. And then I went to university and I studied Native American studies and anthropology. I did my dissertation on a topic that was designed to bring back to light sleeping knowledge within the Choctaw traditional arts so that the community could revitalize them. Um, after that, I began working as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Choctaw Nation. Um, I do Right now, my research focuses on indigenous Choctaw foods. So there are many different components of our culture that are important, but I think that one is the most important for improving quality of life today because our community faces diabetes, obesity, stroke, cancer at a higher rate than most of the rest of the American population. And one of the keys to overcoming that can be our own traditional foods. So that's led me to um, various different paths and including meeting the Choctaw hog. Um, you know, I, I put together a book on indigenous Choctaw food um, I manage a program for Choctaw Nation that's called Growing Hope. We go out and collect threatened Choctaw heritage seeds. We grow those out. We share them with tribal members so that they can produce our traditional foods and various things like that. Great. Oh, geez. <laughs> Today's going to be awesome. Woo. All right. Um, so, Ian, I, you kind of mentioned how food is really a cornerstone, uh, not just to... Um, of the Choctaw culture, but really to culture, period. Um, kind of talk about how the Choctaw hog really influenced uh, Choctaw Nation foodways uh, in, like, in the early beginnings. Well, our community has oral traditions that talk about how we began as a people. And according to some of these stories, we were created from the ground in what's now East Central Mississippi, a place called Mount Alaya. Um, our homelands, East Central Mississippi and Western Alabama. And our oral stories, you know, they don't have dates, but there are things within them that are datable, datable events. So some of our early oral stories talk about our ancestors living in that region at a time when there were giant animals that are now extinct. They traveled in large packs, large herds, and they were big enough that they were able to destroy the trees in the area by breaking off the branches and taking out the bark, burling them, killing the trees. And according to our oral stories, that's what created the Black Belt Prairie, which you can still see in that area today. These stories talk about these animals eventually going extinct. They attribute it to disease. You know, it appears in hindsight, looking at things archaeologically, it appears that those stories talk about the Pleistocene megafauna the giant animals that used to live in North America and all over the world at the end of the last ice age, about 12,000 years ago. Wow. You walk through the Choctaw homeland at that time, you know, it was a mixed pine forest and you could come up upon elephants standing 13 feet tall. That appears to be what the oral stories are about, mastodons and mammoths. They both live there in the homeland. You can come upon ground sloths that are 12 feet tall. Uh, you can come upon, you can come upon armadillos that weighed as much as a Volkswagen Beetle. And, and you can also come upon this animal called 
Milo Hyas, and it was a Pleistocene pig that lived there in our homeland. It lived on the edges of the forest, um, different species of that genus were adapted to eating grass or to eating uh, shrubs that are along the edge of the woods. And most likely our ancestors used to hunt them. So, you know, the very beginnings of Choctaw culture, 600 generations ago, the pig was there. But then as the climate changed, you know, the, the glacial ice sheets in the Northern hemisphere, most of them melted and that completely changed the growing conditions in the Southeast, which changed the habitat. About about 9,000 years ago, Milo Hyatt had gone extinct. And for the next almost 8,500 years, Choctaw society developed without the pig until the Spanish reintroduced it in the 1500s. And that animal that they reintroduced is, is the ancestor of today's Choctaw hog. So when they reintroduced the animal, you know, you're thinking about this animal that um, is not exactly indigenous. You know, it was 9,000 years ago, but it's not now. So certain elements of our, our culture were adapted to accommodate this new animal. So for example, in the Choctaw language, shulka is, was originally the word for the possum. And for whatever reason, Choctaw people saw similarities between the possum and that Spanish hog. Maybe it's because of the meat, uh, maybe it's because of the way it's built, I'm not exactly sure. But for whatever reason, they started calling this new animal, the pig, shulka. So for a while they called the possum and the pig by the same name. But then the pig became so important to culture that it just kind of put the possum out. So the possum became Shokata, a silver pig, and the pig just became Shoka. You can see that in other ways with the language, too. For example, the, the old Choctaw word for the beech tree is Hatom Balapa. But when pigs came in, Choctaws began to raise them. Um, there was really good browse around Choctaw villages in some areas. And one of the things that we like to feed the hogs on was beech nuts from the beech tree. So instead of being called Hakon Balaha, that plant, that tree got renamed to Shokat Tanchi, which means hog corn. The, there are different streams in Choctaw country that got named after the pig. Um, for a while, Choctaw people considered the pig to be something that, that was not really good to eat. You know, they sensed that the pig was able to carry disease, which it certainly was. When the Spanish brought the pig in, it carried influenza. Um, diseases ravaged Choctaw communities and other Native American communities too. You know, ultimately that led to like a 90% fatality rate. You know, the Americans had about 100 million people at the time of Columbus and that dropped to about 10 million by late 1600s. And hogs were a part of that. And Choctaw folks recognized that. So when the hog came into Choctaw country, we raised them, but we didn't eat them. We exported them to the French colonies along Mobile Bay. For, for generations, like two or three generations. And then eventually Choctaw people started to eat a little bit of the hog meat, but even so it was kind of taboo. So for example, when a couple was expecting a baby, the man would abstain from eating hog meat to make sure that that child would grow up healthy. Eventually it, the hog did start to be a part of the Choctaw cuisine. Um, it was, it was, it was used for its meat, of course, but, but other things too. Um, when I was talking earlier about the, the Pleistocene megafauna, one of the oldest recorded Choctaw dishes that we have is a way that the meat from those animals was preserved. Basically, it was just made into jerky like people all over the world did. The Choctaw name for that jerky is Nipishilla. But when the hog came, the Spanish and the French introduced salt, salt pork. So the Choctaw name is Nipishilla. Instead of being jerky, it came to mean salt pork. So that's how the food was incorporated, how hog meat was incorporated into our diet. Uh, it was added to our national dish, Tanchi Labona, which is this hominy dish. Well, originally it had bear meat in it, it had different types of things in it, but today people don't consider that to be really well made unless it's got hog meat in it. Um, true. The pork is great, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> So it's been important, like I was telling you about the, the name change for the possum and the hog. Well, in our culture, we have animal stories. And those stories have animal main characters and they're used to teach different lessons to the youth. And the main character in those stories quite often is possum and he's a trickster. You know, he tries to do things the easy way and he usually gets in trouble for it. So that, that's where the lesson comes in. So the stories were called possum talk, but when the language shift happened, now they're called pig talk, even though even though pig doesn't appear in those stories at all, that's what they're called. So you can kind of see how it moved in and replaced some indigenous things and it was incorporated and became an important part of our culture, the Choctaw home. Wow. 
Wow. Uh, my brain is just about to fry. I'm just learning so much right now. And I'm like, oh, man, so much history, so much culture. Um, I, I guess kind of talk a little bit about uh, the, some of the dishes that Choctaw Nation has uh, been able to really help establish um, that most Americans might know about, but don't necessarily know the heritage that's behind it. Talk about some of those dishes that the Choctaw Naval, uh, Nation contributed to. Sure. So, so let me back up a little bit. When you're thinking about the, the contributions the Choctaw people made to American food, you know, the, the Choctaw tribe is one of the largest tribes in the United States. Um, today, we have three different federally recognized Choctaw groups. There's the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians in, in the homeland in Mississippi. We've got about 10,000 members. There's the Gina Band of the Choctaws in Louisiana with 250 members. And then there's the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma with about 200,000 members. So we're the third largest tribe in the country. We've got lots and lots of folks. And if you look at European accounts and the accounts from other tribes 200 years ago, we, we were not only one of the largest tribes, but we were also one of the most prolific agriculturally. So we created agricultural produce and traded that to other tribes. We traded it to French colonies. We traded it to American um, to uh, American colonists too over time. So you've got this food going out from Choctaw people and food knowledge going out from Choctaw people in these different directions. When Europeans first came into the area, um, Native Americans, most especially Choctaw folks, taught them how to do a form of intercropped corn agriculture, which is corn, beans, and squash, grain, or sunflowers, different things like that. Together, those plants create a more sustainable agricultural field because the corn stalk grows up tall. It provides a place for the beans to run. But the corn stalk takes a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. So the beans or legumes, they put the nitrogen back in the soil. And then Choctaw squash, they have these massive leaves, so they'll shade the soil and keep it from drying out. They also prevent weeds, at least before Bermuda grass came in, they prevented weeds. So it creates its own ecosystem. And then when you eat it together, all three, corn, beans, and squash, it creates a complete protein, so it's more healthy than any of those apart. So that type of basis, that corn agriculture, that became part of the basis for American Southern cuisine. You know, you think about cornbread, you think about pumpkin pie, you think about grits. All that stuff was influenced by my Choctaw folks. Not just the ingredients that were traded, but also the knowledge that was that was shared with people that came in. So Choctaw food is, is part of the roots of American soul food, American Southern cuisine. Um, going back a little bit, a little bit farther west, you know, we've got the French colonies of Mobile, um, New Orleans, those areas. Choctaw folks came into those areas to trade. We actually changed our, our yearly round. Like we had a certain yearly round where we focused on different types of foods in different months of the year. And in the wintertime, we traditionally hunted. Sometimes we combined that winter hunt with going to New Orleans or going to Mobile to trade. So when we were there, we traded different things that came from the fall hunt or different things that were gathered. So, you know, for example, sassafras leaves or something that was gathered in the fall. And those were brought to French colonies. And those French colonies were melting pots. You had folks coming in from Africa. You had the French there. You had influence from the Spanish. And a new cuisine was created there called Cajun cuisine. And this combines Choctaw food with those other ethnicities. So filet gumbo, for example, is a, a good thing to look at for how that combination happened. You know, it's got the sassafras leaves, the filet from the Choctaws. Uh, it's got the tomatoes from the Spanish. It's got the the chicken from the French, um, it's got the, the okra from the folks from Africa, and it just combines all those different flavors and culinary cuisines. Mm. Um, Choctaw folks also contributed to American barbecue. You know, the word barbecue comes from barbacoa in Spanish, which comes from a Native American word from the Caribbean. And it refers to this type of cooking apparatus that's like a grill, basically. Choctaws made that too, and our language is called ayabani but it's like a grill made out of river king. And you put your meat on there, you put your fish on there. And depending on how you set it up, you can either smoke it or you can roast it, you can cook it. So that that was a, a cooking technique that's native to the Southeast. And then when folks from other places came in, um, they, they brought the ingredients for the barbecue sauces. And so that's another sort of cosmopolitan type of food that combined these different cultural traditions, including Choctaw. 
So for those of you who don't know, I used to be a pit master, a uh, commercial pit master. So when you were talking about barbecue and really just food in general, I was like, oh man, I got to try all of these things. Uh, I know I'll do a, um, uh, go to a boucherie and um, normally we'll get some Cajun folks that will come down from Louisiana all the way up to North Carolina and their gumbo is the most amazing thing I've ever had, gumbo. Um, and so I never knew that there was Native American heritage in gumbo. I knew about the French and maybe some of the Spanish and I definitely knew um, the African influence but no one never taught me that there was Native American influence in a dish that I actually love and enjoy. Um, so thank you, Ian, for kind of sharing a little bit about that. Uh, before we go into our next question, I want to see if we have any questions from our audience. What we got, Brittany? Yes, we've got a bunch of people checking in and saying hello. Let's see. Scott Newman says, woo, he's real excited. Woo. Thanks for joining us today, Scott. Uh, let's see. John says hello from Michigan. Hello. Thanks for joining us today. Natalie said, man, that's so cool. I agree. This is super awesome today. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Natalie. Uh, Scott also says that's awesome. We agree. <laughs> um, John had some growing in North Carolina. I'm not sure what you're growing, John, but I'm sure it's delicious. <laughs> Baca says, greetings, everyone, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks for joining us. Um, they were easy feeders and great mothers. I assume that's Choctaw hogs. John, let us know what you're growing. Or raising. Or raising. Uh, let's see. Baca says she knew it. She knew you were a pit master, and the men are some of the best pit masters. <laughs> Brian might agree. Uh, Shelly says she doesn't have Choctaw, but it's always interesting to learn about other breeds. Mm. Thanks for joining us today, Shelly. Uh, Phil says, how about how do you make hominy? That's a good question. Thanks for joining us today, Phil. Sure. So traditionally, you think about corn, like at certain times in, in our history, corn made up as much as 65% of our diet. <laughs> Corn's got a lot of calories in it, but there are certain uh, nutrients in it, like lysine, that it it has, but your body can't access it directly. So Native American people learned that if you expose corn to an alkali solution, it changes the corn chemically. It makes it so that your body can absorb those other nutrients. Um, it kills the toxins in the mold. It adds a different flavor. So basically, it helps diversify the diet. Um, for the for the alkali solution, what Choctaw people use traditionally was wood ash. You know, it's got a, a very strong the alkaline pH. Um, you take the corn, and our old recipes call for using flint corn, which was our original type of corn. Our dent corn didn't arrive until the Spanish came, probably. So you take that flint corn, and you soak it in water, and you add a hand of wood ash, a handful of wood ash, and you leave it there overnight. And then you come back the next day, and there are different ways to prepare it. And some of the ways you um, take the, the husk off the corn by hand and leave it whole. In other ways, you um, take the corn and dry it slightly and put it in a wooden mortar and pestle and pound it to break up the kernels a little bit and then pull out those husks. And then you boil them and you can add all different kinds of stuff to it to diversify it. One of my favorite things to add to it is hickory nuts. You take hickory nuts and grind them up and put it in and it's like adding butter. It's amazing. But Another thing that, that most people use today is hog meat. They'll take a, a hog roast and throw it in there with a hominy and a slow cooker and let it cook for six or seven hours until it falls off the bone and then, then you thread it. That sounds delicious. Oh man, I'm getting hungry over here, guys. It, it can especially especially depending on what you add to it. It can be real good. That's a great like question. Thanks, Phil. Oh, let's see, we got one more from Kathy and she's already enjoying the episode. I'm so glad you're joining us today. All right. Feel free oh. to let us know if you have more questions. Go ahead and write them in and we'll get to them in the next segment. Woo! Well, good questions, guys. Um, so Ian, I want to go back to you and kind of talk a little bit about how the Choctaw Nation uh, went from 
Uh, going more into pastoral management, uh, I know from some of the information that I know about the Choctaw hog, as well as some of the other uh, livestock, is that uh, pigs normally, and then most people will keep pigs in a pen and just feed them. Um, but what I've heard in some stories is that with Choctaw hogs, traditionally, um, they just let them run loose um, and then recapture them and then feed them uh, to kind of get fat on them and then sell them to the market. So talk a little bit about that technique and just the history behind that. Sure. So there, there are things that we don't know about that, that technique. Um, in the 1700s, Choctaw folks lived in villages. And our villages were set up to take the best advantage of agricultural soil. So houses were like maybe, maybe 200 yards away from each other. And then there were crop areas in between. And then there were large crop areas outside. From reading the old accounts at that time period, we know that hogs were in and around the village. But by the same token, those agricultural fields weren't fenced. So I, I'm not positive. There, there had to be a way to keep the hogs out of the fields, but I'm not positive how they did it. Um, it's also interesting reading those old accounts. There weren't a lot of feral hogs around the Choctaw villages. Like after removal, after the Trail of Tears, the feral hogs move in and decimate the area. But when Choctaws were there, they weren't. So, you know, we either had a really good way to herd them up or we kept them pinned somehow. But exactly how we did that, I'm not positive. I do know that later in time, um, the Indian agent encouraged Choctaws to give up that traditional village and to move out as homesteaders, more like a European system. Mm -hmm. And that, where we had our hogs and we had our cows, and those were free range. Um, at that time period, you know, when, when a Choctaw couple had a baby, like they would give the newborn a man male and female horse, male and female pig, male and female chicken, and all of that. Wow. With the idea being that when they got old enough to marry and start their own household, they'd have their own flocks that could support their home. And at that time, they were free range, but before that, I'm not positive how they, how they grow. See, I'll raise my kids that way. Once they're out the house, they already know how to farm. Oh, man. Um, you had mentioned the Trail of Tears. And uh, I don't think a lot of people really understand what exactly that is. Could you talk a little bit about that to our audience? Sure. So it's, it's hard to overemphasize how important the connection between our community and the land was. You know, it's, it's 600 generations deep. For, for almost 15,000 years, our ancestors have lived in that area. The land had become a part of our culture, a part of our language, and Choctaw people had shaped the land. So you know, you think about the natural ecosystems of the Southeast, like none of those were really natural. They were all created by management by Native American communities. It's like this deep connection. Um, I don't know if folks never really thought about ownership of land. It was just there for anybody to use. When European colonial powers came in, they introduced the idea of land boundaries through treaty. Um, so the Choctaw signed treaties with European powers, and over time, is the balance of power shift. Like originally Choctaws helped European powers because they, you know, they didn't have enough food and stuff like that. But as that balance shifted, European powers started to demand Choctaw concessions for various reasons. They said, you know, you're gonna have to give us five million acres of your land for various reasons. So the Choctaw homeland started to shrink and shrink and shrink through these treaties. In the 18 teens, um, the United States was involved in the battle, or involved in the War of 1812. You know, Britain came in and tried to take back over the young country as one of its colonies. Andrew Jackson was famous for helping to prevent that in the South. You know, he fought and overcame the British at Pensacola at the Battle of New Orleans. The Choctaws were right there helping him. You know, that he'd asked Choctaws to come fight with them, and, and we did. We thought we were friends with Andrew Jackson. But then when he became president, the very next year, he signed the Indian Removal Act, which set up a process to remove the large southeastern tribes from their homeland in the southeast entirely and take us to Indian territory. Indian territory is present day Oklahoma. There were other tribes living here already. It was part of their homeland. But, you know, that didn't matter. So ultimately, Andrew Jackson sent treaty negotiating negotiators to the Choctaw for one final treaty, and even though we've been allies of the United States all along. They threatened military invasion. Um, they threatened killing any Choctaw person that opposed them. 
anybody that was left alive, they were going to make into slaves and charge taxes. So basically, they put the Choctaw folks between a rock and a hard place. For most people, there was no choice but to leave for Indian territory. Um, treaty provisions set up a lot of different things that would help to preserve people's lives as they made that 500 mile journey. For various reasons, most of those things were not provided. So, you know, people traveled across present day parts of Mississippi and Arkansas in really harsh conditions with no food. Um, they went in the wintertime to try to avoid disease, but disease still found them anyway. So, in the 1830s, about 12,000 Choctaw people made the journey to what's now Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears, and about between a third and a quarter of them died for the reasons I've just talked about. After the talk about the Trail of Tears didn't end in the 1830s. We were the first southeastern tribe on the Trail of Tears. We we're also the last. Our, our very last removal was 1903, and even on that one, a bunch of people died. The Trail of Tears is Hinnan Michigan Okchilawa in the Choctaw language. Um, got its name because on the first removal there was a, a newspaper reporter that spoke with a, a Choctaw leader as he was taking his people across Arkansas. He described it as a trail of tears and death and that's what got its name. But then it was applied to the removal of other tribes too like the Chickasaws and the Creeks and the Seminoles and most famously the Cherokees. Hmm. That is quite the disheartening and yeah, I mm, not going to cry. Um, yeah, I am glad that uh, we are moving in the direction that is starting to see people as people, and not as property, not as um, an object. Um, I'm glad that we are moving in a direction where we can find more sense of equality and equity. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I want to cry. <clears throat> um, when we had talked in a previous interview, uh, pre-interview, uh, you had mentioned a uh, thing called a uh, hog fry and how that kind of related to church, Choctaw community, um, and really being able to find uh, some kind of balance of, uh, of a community experience um, in this new land of Oklahoma. Talk a little bit more about that. Sure. So before the Trail of Tears, our, our community was deeply tied to the homeland. And it was set up so that you know women were the heads of households. Like your, your family name went through your mom's side. The woman owned the house. She owned all the property within the house except for the guy's weapons. So women were like the core of society. When the Trail of Tears happened, that society was jumbled up. For the Choctaws, people were kind of a haphazard fashion. So it's not like this whole town picks up and goes on the Trail of Tears. It's more like these few houses do this year, these few houses do next year. And they all arrive in different places in Oklahoma. So when Choctaw folks found themselves in Oklahoma, they didn't have that community support structure through their mom and their grandma like they did in the past. This was also the time that a lot of Choctaw people, most Choctaw people converted to Christian religions, you know, to different Protestant faiths. And so instead of having the old clan structure as social organization, we took on the church structure as social organization. So like the church became the center of the community. And it wasn't a place where people just went for religious services, but they went there like for every big community event. They spent lots of time there uh, outside of just strict services, although those, those certainly happened a lot too. And the sense of community was rebuilt around those churches. And of course, the Choctaws, like anybody else, part of the sense of community involves sharing meals together. And hogs were an ideal choice. You know, you can move hogs around. It's, it's food on the foot, basically. So you, you could take them from your house over here 20 miles away and bring them to church. And, you know, it's not going to go bad because the hogs are fine. Uh, when they would butcher the hogs, you know, it, it brought back that old ethic of community support. You know, everybody participated, like no matter how, how young they were or how old, they all participated in some way. So talking with elders, you know, they were involved in this as children, and their job was maybe to boil the water to scald the hogs what they did. So they started the fire and they put the pot over it. 
other other people, you know, young ladies, they might be preparing food to help the folks who were butchering have something to eat. When they butchered the hog, they maintained some of the old practices, like they would have used on deer or bear in the past. So as they were butchering it, the first thing that they did was they would take out the kidneys and they would just take those and put them in the coals of the fire that was used to hot so you the water. And then they that just straight like as soon as they could. Mm. You know, with like people with a Western food tradition, that might sound a little weird, but if, if you think about it, like when when a panther takes down an animal, the first thing that it eats are the internal organs. It's not the tender one. So yeah. talking to people knew that and it was about nutrition. So they knew that that was one of the, the most nutrient dense things to eat from the animal. So they would eat those and some of the other internal organs. Um, they would take the meat and put it in that big cast iron pot on the fire, you know, like, like many people across the South, and they put some of the lard in there and fry it up. Mm -hmm. My, my father-in-law grew up in that kind of tradition. He talks about the old Choctaw ladies sitting there stirring the pot. Mm -hmm. And every, it seems like every Choctaw church has these, these churchyard dogs that live there. They, they just hang out there and wait for people to feed them. So he talks about the lady be stirring that pot and the dog would come up and try to get some of the meat out of it. She'd take that stick and just whack the dog, just kind of the dog, and then just take the stick back in and keep stirring. And they, you know, obviously it was hot enough, I guess it killed any bacteria or whatever. So um, they would cook the meat and they would put it, a little bit later times, they'd put it in tin cans and use the lard to seal it because they didn't have refrigeration, you know, up until pretty recently, a lot of people didn't. So that would preserve it. Um, using the old ethic, you know, like one of the ways to respect an animal is to use every part of it when you butcher it. So they did that with hogs too, just like they had with deer before or whatever. Um, they take the intestines and clean them out. They make what's called scona in Choctaw or, or chitlins in English. Um, I actually just learned how to do that a couple weeks ago, how to take them out and turn them inside out and clean them and all that. Ooh, how um, was that? What's that? How was that? Well, I didn't actually eat them. I was using them to make bowstrings, but I learned the cleaning process the same as they're making chitlins. Okay, good, good. Yeah, like the, you know, they'd save other organs and make hog head cheese. Um, my wife's grandmother, her favorite thing was the hog's feet. They, they used every part of it, and it was shared that there's a community together. I think what's interesting about that is, you know, you look at the western model of food and even looking today pigs i talked about pigs to a lot of people and all a lot of people care about is bacon sausage maybe ham pork chops other than that people don't realize that a pig is more than just that uh, so when you're talking about eating pig's feet eating chickens uh like my grandmother um during christmas uh, she was bringing that up, and it's like, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you know, you can't find a lot. Of, like, if you try to find uh, chicklins in the store, like they're gone in, in seconds. And oh, I remember when I used to have to clean out chicklins, and how that was a lot of work. And, and I'm just like, ew, <laughs> I just don't. I'm not at that level yet where I'm like comfortable. But pig's feet, oh yeah, all day, any day, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Um, being able to uh, see like the uh, intestines and the um, what's called offal, O F A L. Um, when you're talking about, you know, you want to eat that immediately. Part of the reason why is because those those internal organs don't have a strong shelf life. Um, so after a couple of days, they're not all that good. Um, and so being able to eat that on the spot right then, eat the pig's heart. Oh. Pig's heart, oh, ooh, cast iron, sauteed, oh, ooh, ooh, just a little bit of sea salt, some pepper. That's all you need, folks. That is all you need. Um, anyways, not getting my pit master stuff in there. Um, I wanted to open up and see if there were any more questions, comments, and then I'll ask Ian a final question. Yes, let's see. We've got some. Let's see. Jeanette says she loves your book. Can you talk about the Choctaw national dish with pork? Thanks sure. for having us, Jeanette. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, the Choctaw national dish with pork, it's tante labona. 
So it, it's a, a hominy dish, one I talked about a little bit before, but, but let me give you a modern version of it, one that anybody can make. The, the closest type of corn I, I've been able to find commercially to our traditional hominy corn is Goya brand yellow corn. So we take that and we put it in a, a crock pot. Um, I like to add in hickory nuts. If you can't find those, you can use sunflower seeds, put them in a food processor or a spice grinder and grind them up real fine, put them in there. Um, traditional Choctaw food doesn't have much salt, but you can add a little bit of salt if you want to. And you let that cook maybe four hours or so before it's done. You put in some pork chop, you let it cook until it starts to fall off the bone. Yeah. I like to add in filet gumbo, like the, the powder for that, the sassafras leaves. I like to put those in. I, I like the flavor that it gives. And, you know, in that particular form, that's about it. But there, there are all kinds of other things you could add to. Some people in the past put beans in it. Some people put squash. It, it's a really variable dish. Thank you, Jeanette. Let's see. Shelly says, how fantastic that you have such a rich history on the Choctaw breed and how it became pertinent in the lifestyle and diets of the indigenous and immigrant people. I'm glad that you could tune in today, Shelly. Thank you. And, and everybody has stories like this. You know, my focus is, is Choctaw because that's the community I'm part of. But it, it doesn't matter where you come from. If you go back far enough, your community has stories like this, too. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Roy says he's currently raising Florida cracker cattle and Piney Woods cattle. He's looking for a good variety of heritage hog to raise for farm to table pork. Are there any that you recommend? I'm going to turn that over to Ryan. He, he, he does. Ooh, yeah. Hey there, Roy. Um, okay. So Choctaw is where the cup up and, uh, Mostly they're isolated in Oklahoma. All right. So I don't know if you want to drive all the way to Oklahoma to go find some Choctaw pigs. Um, I think, shoot me an email. <laughs> I'm like, it, because my, whenever someone asks me that, my question is, it depends. It depends on um, your full market. It depends on what kind of clientele you want to have. It depends on what you are comfortable doing. Um, so shoot me an email at rcu. R E T O N at livestockconservancy.org. Uh, and I can help you out with that part. Uh, also, you can find my email on the livestockconservancy.com website. Uh, but yeah, shoot me an email. Uh, I'd love to answer that question in a non time constraint uh, live stream. <laughs> Right, I'll hook you up with his email as a comment after the show. We'll be following up. Thanks for watching today. Um, let's see. Thanks for joining us today, Seth. He says he loves hearing about the heritage of the Choctaw Nation and how it relates to hogs and sustenance. Um, thanks for tuning in today, Randy. He says pickled pigs feet are great. Yeah, big fan over here. Yeah. Matthew says hogshead is a lost dish. So don't worry, we're bringing it back. We're bringing it back, Matthew. Let's see. All I'm seeing is some love for all of this delicious food we are talking about today. Let me see if there is a question. Sheila has one more question. Um, do you have a favorite breed? And why is that your favorite? <laughs> this is also oh, probably <laughs> Y'all are just, y'all are, y'all are some silly people. Um, all right. Um, my favorite breed, and I only say this from my experience, is English large black or just large black hog and uh, red wattle. Um, and if you would like to know more about that, um, Brittany will hook you up with my email and we can chat. Excellent. And Carol is giving us a thumbs up. So thanks for tuning in today, Carol. We're glad you're here. If you all have questions for Ian, please write them. We're loving all of your comments, and we're so glad that you're enjoying the show today. All right. So, Ian, I just have one just kind of final end question. It's not really as much a question as much as a last statement that I would like for you to 
I kind of make. Um, for a lot of people who don't realize how important Native American culture is to the American culture, uh, kind of talk a little bit about why the Choctaw Nation is important, why the Choctaw Nation is relevant even in today's conversation. Sure. So, you know, Native American people in some ways are, are just like anybody else in the United States. You know, we're, we're just like any other Americans. We, we pay taxes. We, we live in modern houses. We drive cars, that kind of thing. Some people think Natives still live in teepees and all that, but, but we don't. But that being said, what makes us unique is, you know, the depth of connection that we have with this land. You know, our, our ancestors and our cultures come from a perspective that's very, very long term. So because of that, sometimes it gives us unique perspectives and things that are long, long term. Um, Choctaw in particular have made a number of contributions to American society, and those are continuing today. Um, you know, for example, in World War One, a lot of one of the things that folks focus on for Choctaw contributions to American society is the role that our soldiers played in, in World War One. Um, there were a number of young men from Oklahoma who were Choctaw and they'd grown up in the government school system where they were punished for speaking the Choctaw language. But then when World War I began, uh, they willingly signed up to fight for the United States. And then some of these units were predominantly Native Americans and smaller units were predominantly Choctaw and their, their commanders realized that they were communicating in the Choctaw language. Again, a language they had been prevented from speaking at American schools. But the commanders asked them to use that language to make a code to transmit messages for the allies. And the German officers were, you know, really intelligent folks and they'd been able to break most of the American codes up to that point. But they were never able to break the Choctaw language. So the Choctaw language was used to communicate codes and it, it helped to bring a, a faster end to the war and save America and for that matter, German lives by bringing a, a faster end to it. So that's just one of many examples, you know, we, we're Americans like any other, but we have this unique heritage and sometimes that can benefit broader society. And we the mm. and that, that was World War II, right? That was World War I. World War I? Oh, wow, 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 that's amazing. Well, Ian, um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for uh, being able to teach everyone, myself included, um, not just about pigs, but about the people behind the pigs. Um, it's so important that people see the, the importance of culture, the importance of heritage, the importance of legacy. Uh, and a lot of the things that we do today, it has a legacy attached to it. So just kind of some thoughts that I have um, from this conversation that I want to take home into my heart is really looking at, you know, what do I want my actions to do? And what kind of legacy do I want to have for, you know, my children, my grandchildren, my great, great grandchildren. I want them to be telling stories about me, uh, you know, butchering pigs and, and showing them how to cook food and how to use a cast iron skillet and, um, growing up on a farm, I want stories like that to get passed down. And I think just with this conversation, I just see the importance of it now um, that, you know, written history is great, but being able to also have that oral storytelling is so, so important. Um, it's able to capture um, information and experiences in a way that a book can't quite, quite reach. Um, and so just thank you for inspiring me today. Uh, Brittany, I don't know if you had any final closing thoughts um, or if anyone else in the audience had any final closing thoughts. If you did, leave a comment below. Show Ian love and let know what you think. I'm going to put Ian's website up here. Ian, do you want to talk about how people, what people can find there and how they can contact you if they have questions? Sure, ChoctawNationCulture.com. That's put together by the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma Cultural Services Departments. Um, that's the place to, to go to see articles about Choctaw history and culture that we've written. They're all community-based. They cover all different aspects of what we do. Um, there's lots of information about services that we provide. A lot of those are within Choctaw Nation, but some of them are, are nationwide. 
if you guys have any questions about Choctaw culture, anything along those lines, um, even the sustainability research that we're doing, please feel free to send an email. Perfect. And then I'm also going to put up this, how people can order your book by phone because it's awesome and it's already sold out. <laughs> it's already yeah, sold out. I, I didn't know a whole lot, but there, there is a book on indigenous Choctaw food. It's like our entire food way, 12,000 years of it, but it's written from a perspective of how to revitalize it today. So like if you want to bring traditional Choctaw dishes back to your day, dinner table, that, that book can help you do it. So that, that's a number where you can get it by. Um, not a, a self-promotion here. I donated the book to the tribe. It doesn't go to me. It goes to the tribe, but it's just about getting the information out. That's awesome. Yes, all of these wonderful, shameless self-promotions. Please support Ian and his work. It's amazing. And then I think that's us. If you need to reach us, Livestock Conservancy, uh, you know, I'm going to put our emails there so you can talk, contact Ryan about all of your pig-specific questions. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. I don't see any final questions. Just some comments about how much everybody has loved it today. We appreciate you tuning in and being so supportive and listening. And I think that's it. Any final questions, comments, thoughts, concerns, excitement? Thank you to the Livestock Conservancy. I know you're working to try to save the, the talk to hog. And thank you, guys. I appreciate what you do. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Uh, guys, don't forget, uh, we're doing this for an entire month, right? Um, so we have three more pig chats, as well as a Marketing Monday pig chat that's going to also be about pigs, right? Pigs, 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 more pigs and pigs and pigs, right? So if you have all any kind of questions, uh, comments, thoughts, concerns about uh, raising pigs, or if you're even just slightly interested, um, definitely come back next Tuesday and the very last Monday um, and all Tuesdays, actually, because we're doing this every Tuesday for this month uh, to check us out. Also, if you are loving what we are doing, donate, 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 support, support, support. Um, we want to make sure that we can continue doing this. I know we're not PBS or anything like that. Um, but one thing that we want to do is have more great content that's relevant for you. Um, so with that, I think we can close, right, Brittany? We're done. Everyone have a wonderful week, and thanks again, and we'll see you next week.